if you would like to go on out to coursework and open up session nine's folder and let's see if you can bring up that DWF or that DWF that uh, PDF that explains the assignment I will follow along with you okay so let us talk about what we're going to be doing here what we're going to be doing for this assignment is actually having you design two new buildings okay an office classroom building and a student center building that will have an auditorium in it okay and these are going to be constructed on a site adjacent to an existing university building and your job is to come up with some recommended designs for these two buildings so the office and classroom buildings can have some offices some conference rooms and some classrooms to be shared by three departments and the specific features of the student center auditorium that isn't so firmly set about what has to be in there you're supposed to be a little bit creative about what you'd like to see in that student center and auditorium space okay but you're supposed to come up with a proposed design that ultimately sort of complements the other buildings okay and we're going to be for that student center using design options to explore a couple different alternatives for what the design would look like we'll sort of look at alternatives for what the auditorium might look like and we'll also look, start looking at auditoriums for what the sort of student center oh, sort of cafe workspace might look like okay so these are my design options to sort of explore some different things now to get you started on this we've actually uploaded a Revit model of the existing office classroom <coughs> building into the session 9 folder and if you haven't opened that yet let me just kind of walk you through it a little bit so you can sort of get a sense of what it looks like so here I am let me go ahead and I'll just go to 3D aerial of the existing project, which is phase one. Let me zoom on out. And kind of take you in there and we'll take a look at what we have going. Let me pan that over. Okay, we have a little building here on the landscape. Some of you might recognize that building as being somewhat familiar. Um, it's loosely based on a building that you know far too well. Okay, and the idea is it's a little three-story building that includes, oh, some office and classroom space with an arcade around the front of it. There are some uh, big terraces up on the upper levels and kind of a, a sloping roof with some big columns that are supporting it all around a mechanical space. It's kind of a combination of sort of stone panel surfaces um, with some punched windows in a lot of locations as well as some curtain walls in other locations so it should be a sort of a familiar context for you in terms of like uh, this what this building looks like okay but here's what we want to do relative to that building okay, and here it is on its site plan it's kind of down there in the south uh, western corner of it we want to actually build some other spaces so we have space side side for a new office and classroom building, okay, just to the north side of that, okay. And what we'd like to do is go ahead and build a building which is sort of comparable in form, has about the same amount of space, sort of the same overall size as this building over here, kind of over in this area. But the precise form of it can be a little bit different. In fact, we sort of decided along the way that we'd like something a little more innovative and adventurous and forward thinking than perhaps this building is. Okay, so as you move forward in here, you want to sort of pick up clues from this building, but you don't necessarily want to mimic it. Okay, so what do I mean by that? It'd be nice to sort of think about, when we think about a complex of buildings of similar materials. So maybe we carry some of the sandstone panels across, or maybe we carry some of the orange roofs across, and things like that. But it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly the same thing. You can be a little bit more creative about what's going on here. But do be cognizant of the fact that there's this other building facing the courtyard over here, and that whatever you're doing probably also wants to address that courtyard space. You sort of want to think about that as being sort of a central hub where a lot of activity happens. Okay, so you'll want to do some design around that. Okay, there's also some space over here on the eastern side of the site that's set aside for this new student center and auditorium space. Okay, and by the time you get done with that space, you sort of have a little bit of a quad going here. Okay, and again, this sort of space available to you, that can be a little bit adventurous in terms of what's going on too. So this is the total tableau of space you have available to you. And really, for what we're doing on this, let me sort of comment right up front. Okay, some folks are architectural designers who are really going to push this to the nth degree and have an awful lot of fun with this. Some people aren't, and that's okay. So 
If you're feeling architecturally adventurous and you want to play, please do. We'll encourage that and we'll try and support you in that. If you're not feeling so architecturally adventurous and you're going to be modeling a building, which is a very you know, standard sort of approach and shape and all that type of stuff, again, that's okay. No one's going to be grading you on the quality of your design. Okay, it's really much more on just how you're doing in terms of modeling the buildings and actually creating this whole multi-story space and putting the rooms into it and putting the stairs into it and some of those different things. Okay, so let me get that out of the way right up front because people here are just very widely different levels of uh, design skill level. Okay, so feel free to approach that at the level that's the, mo the most appropriate and comfortable for you okay, in terms of what's going on. Okay, let me go on back over to the assignment sheet. We'll kind of keep talking you through it. So we have the existing model. It has a lot of predefined views, some floor plans, elevations, and 3D views, as well as some schedules. And each of these views is associated with a specific project phase. Let's talk about that. Okay, we're going to do something a little bit different here in that we have an existing building. It's already been created. It's in what we'll call phase one. Okay, we're going to be adding some new buildings, okay, in a future phase, phase two. Okay, and that's actually going to be okay as we're working. The only thing you have to be keeping track of is that every view that we work with, every time we're working, we sort of are working at a specific point in time. So if we work in views that are labeled phase one, we're putting things back in phase one. But the reality is we probably shouldn't be doing a whole lot of work in phase one because phase one's gone. It's out the door. Okay, we want to be working in phase two and showing your building relative to what already got built back in phase one. Okay. So let me show you how that plays out over here in the sheet itself. Okay. You'll see there's all sorts of plans in there. There's level one, phase one. There's level one, phase two. Level two, phase one. Level two, phase two. So let's talk about what we're doing there. Okay. If you go to level one, phase one, for example, we'll get the existing floor plan of the building. Here it is, we've got some classroom buildings, or classroom spaces, we have some office spaces, some stairs in the building. It's kind of just an interesting model to play around with and understand, because it's sort of a good example of a multi-story building. So that's phase one, everything sort of got put together in that phase, and everything's hanging, looking just fine. When it comes time to start adding your buildings, okay, what you actually want to do is not work in phase one, you want to go to phase two. So let's talk about that. Phase two is hanging out here. Notice that the phase one building sort of grayed out, okay? Because we don't really want to be paying too much attention to it. We want to be paying attention to your building. So here's what you do. In fact, let me even kind of show you how you know which phase a drawing goes to. It's a view property. And way down at the bottom of the view properties, there's this notion of really which phase a drawing go or a view belongs to. Now, the reason you want to use the view associated with phase two is if you create things in that view, the items you create will be assumed to be have been created in phase two. Okay, so you want sort of like that's why you go to level two to put things on the second floor level because it assumes that that's where they're going to be hosted. So you want things in phase two, put them in phase two. Okay, but let's kind of show you what the impact of that is. So here I am in phase two. Let me go through, and I'm just going to draw some simple little spaces. For example, I'll draw some walls in here. I'll sort of put them very close to the building just so you can sort of see the difference. OK, I have some walls over here. If I look at their properties, you'll see they're actually in phase two. That's when they were created. Whereas these walls over here, if I look at their properties, are created back in phase one. Now, how does this sort of play out in terms of the views? In phase two, since it's in the future, I can always see into the past. Okay, I can always, because phase one never went away. It's still hanging around. But let's try switching it around the other way. If I go to phase one, okay, notice phase two's building isn't there. Okay, so that's what you have to watch out for. If you put things in phase two, they'll be in phase <coughs> two forward, but they don't go back. If you put things in phase one, they'll be in phase one forward into two, into three, but again, they won't go back. 
So always kind of think of it that way. That even sort of plays out in terms of these 3D views. Here's phase one, the aerial that just shows the existing building. Here's phase two, an aerial that shows the existing building in gray in my new very short walls. Jeez. Put unconnected is always a popular uh, height. <laughs> okay, and those are in phase two. Again, notice that you can sort of tell which ones are in phase one or phase two just based on sort of what's gray and what's not. Yes? <laughs> oh, actually, what happens is what we need to do is yeah, it's if you close it and then open Revit architecture and open it from within the file menu there, it'll open in Revit architecture. It just means the last person on that machine used Revit structure last. Yes? Ah, oh, what a very good question. And how that looks is as follows. Okay. There's this whole notion of phases. Okay, you got that. Phase one, phase two, phase three. Okay. There's this notion <laughs> of something called phase filters. And phase filters really just controls what the visibility is like. And we have a phase filter set up right now, which basically grays out the old and highlights the new. So if you want to show them both evenly, okay, let me show you that. What I'll do is I'll take 3D Arial and I'll duplicate that, or any of the views. I'll give that a new name, like 3D Arial, and I'll just call it like uh, Show All. Okay. And then this is going to have a property too, and we'll go to the view. properties. And then way down at the bottom, you have previous plus new, or if you just say show all. Actually, it should work. Let me see what's not going on there. It is showing all, but let me see. Hmm. You know, we'll talk about this more on Thursday, but let me kind of show you how I'd fix it just to answer your question. And then don't worry if this gets a little bit weird. Under manage, under phases. Okay, so the view. Let me see the properties. Now, actually, it is what's happening is there's a phase filter, and I'm thinking show all would show them all evenly, but it's not. And look, so what we're going to do is we're going to find a new filter that actually will show them all evenly. Let me go back to that filter thing. I'll show you what I mean. So phases. Okay, here's phase one, phase two. Okay, if we want to add phase three and four, we can add that on there. This is phase filters. Show all, one of the default ones, shows the new things by category. That is using their natural color. But existing and demolished things are overridden. That means they're sort of grayed out. So what I'm going to do is actually just create myself a new one. Show all evenly. Okay, and I'll say new is by category. That is in the natural color. And I'll also say existing is the by category in the natural color. Okay. So if I change this view property now to again be show all evenly <coughs> as opposed to show all, which we already had this predefined meeting. Okay, then they're all sort of in the natural color. Okay, now, don't worry if that we got gate went by a little bit fast. We'll talk more about phases and how to set up phase filters on Thursday, more specifically there. I just want to let you know about these different drawings and the phases associated with them, just so as you start working, you know to put things in phase two generally. Okay, we'll also talk about how in phase two, you can go demolish parts of phase one and kind of get some rid of some things if you need to sort of connect or kind of take out parts of what's already there. Okay, so that's another feature of phases. But pretty much you have to know that each of these different views has a phase. Notice the 3D views have phasing also, as well as the elevations. So very common mistake that everyone sort of runs into when it comes time to turn it all in. You do all your fantastic modeling. You put everything in phase two. You want to do elevations okay, that show your new buildings. Okay. These elevations are set to phase one. They don't show your new buildings because you're just back too far in time. So what you need to do is actually create a new elevation that will show your phases, or that will show phase two. How do you do that? Not to worry. 
say duplicate the view. You can rename that view. And then with that view, don't forget the final step, it's not just renaming it, we have to go through and choose its view properties. And then you can say show previous plus, oops, <coughs> I have to set it to phase two. Let me zoom on out. Now, when you've changed the phasing, that's probably half the battle, you might need to adjust the crop to make sure that your new building is still showing up or is showing up relative to the existing building. Of course, I'm choosing the wrong one because the building I designed is right behind that one. Here, let me put a little bit of it hanging out so we'll actually see it. Why aren't you there? Oh, this another sort of thing. Let's take a look at that too. Let's go to the, uh, see if I can zoom on out. There's the whole idea of the elevation, what the cropping of the elevation is, and how far back it's looking. So I might need to adjust those. And there it is, it's finally poking itself out there. Or if I really wanted to be good and just point specifically to that one, I could say, Let's go ahead and pull the elevation back so it's really just focusing on that building instead. And then I'll get that one. So we're going to do a little, yeah, as you do your design, you'll be in pretty good shape there. But when it's time to document things, we'll have to duplicate some views, change them to the right phase, okay, and then just adjust the cropping to make sure that what you're trying to show is showing in the views. Okay, but that's kind of the idea of the views. Even on down here, yes. I probably wouldn't. I would probably just sort of omit them and really just focus on your building. Otherwise, it'll just get sort of really big and cluttered with all the information there. We'll probably still be there in the 3D in the 3D views and stuff like that, and then any of the renderings that'll still show up. But for the elevations, I'd probably omit them. Okay. Um, schedules and things like that work the same way. So as part of the assignment, we're going to ask you to sort of give us a door schedule, give us a window schedule of phase two so we can sort of know what doors are new, what windows are new, things like that. So let's talk about that. In the same sort of sense, we can have a door schedule for phase one that shows all the doors of the existing building. But for our schedule for phase two, we don't care about those old doors. They're already installed and you know they're already there right now. We only really care about the new ones because those are the ones that are gonna have to be purchased for your project. So if you go to phase two, and there's not really very many doors kind of hanging around in there right now. But what you can do is, under properties, you can choose a phase, and you could also choose a phase filter. This is an example of where, if we wanted to include the existing ones, we could say previous plus new, but if I only want to include the new ones, I could just say show new. Okay, and it'll filter those down and only show those instead. Okay, so. That's really the gist of sort of working with these different views. What you're going to do is for all these different views, you're going to have the whole notion of having a phase one and a phase two, and then it's making sure you're showing the right things in those. But beyond that, you pretty much model the same way. It's just sort of a little, uh, it's negotiating sort of this issue of what you're showing in each of the different views, and that's always a view property. Okay, let's pause there for just a second before I go back to the assignment. Sort of so yeah, we're again, we're going to go over all this stuff about phase filters and how to control that stuff a lot more on Thursday. I just want to sort of get that out there so you know how to get started. So sort of makes sense? Roughly? Yes? So, um, you said two vendors, so you have two vendors for the elevation. Like, what are the other elevations you have? Like, each whole elevation for the first vendor being all the new buildings, and then the other one for the other four ones? I would probably do, it's really, yeah. Two different elevation sheets. I it's ignore the existing building. Don't even worry about that. Just cut it out, you know, from what you're considering. But I would probably have one sheet of elevations for the new office building and one sheet of elevations for the new uh, auditorium student center. Because they really are that's the way we'd probably think about it. But then for the site plan view, like, 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 exactly. For the site plan view, 
for that one, yeah, just in very good point there. Yeah, it'd be the site plan will be really, really helpful for just showing how all the different buildings are related to each other. So this view, even at a smaller scale, it's actually it's already at one to twenty, at a smaller scale, showing this the overall footprint of the three buildings and how they relate together will be really helpful for getting people oriented, yeah, to what's showing on in the other views. Yes. No. We're good. Okay. Let's go back and look at the assignment again. Wherever it went. There it is. Okay. So again, we have these existing views set up. They're all set up for phase one existing. The new phase ones, the ones that say phase two, are the ones that where you should be creating your new proposed building. And you're going to be doing almost all of your design work in the new phase two view, say leaving phase one alone. So let's go back to your design program then, which you have to do. So your client has asked you to come up with a new design for these two buildings to meet the needs of their expanding engineering programs. Okay, we created the old building a few years ago, uh, but we didn't build all the buildings in the complex at that time. Now we're going ahead and building some more buildings to complement it. This might sound like a familiar scenario based on things you see going on right around you here. Okay. The university is ready to complete these buildings, but they sort of decided they want to update things and have things a little bit different. So we're going to complement but not mimic the existing style. For the new classroom building, we would like to go ahead and accommodate some space Okay, uh, for three different departments. <coughs> Actually, it looks like there's four different departments here. Okay, with different square footages associated for each of them. Actually, there's five different departments there. <laughs> it's growing as I speak. Okay, so we would like to make sure we have some space that we're going to allocate to the different departments. On Thursday, again, we're going to talk about really how we can subdivide space and produce reports that show you not just room by room, but how you can sort of take an entire block of space and measure that and say, okay, so many thousand square feet here, so many thousand square feet there. Now, these guidelines are really just to help you get started. Again, don't go worrying. If your Earth Systems Department is 4,200 square feet, Okay, if it's 4,300 square feet, no one's sweating it. If it's 10,000 square feet, okay, think about it. <laughs> okay, so it's just somewhere in between. Okay, so guidelines. Also, watch out for this one. Additional circulation and utility space. People don't think about it, but there's useful assignable space in a building, and there's everything else, which is hallways and bathrooms and stairways and utility rooms and Xerox rooms and stuff like that. And they actually account for a very significant amount of the space. So above and beyond these useful spaces, okay, you probably have about another 25 to 30 percent of your space just thrown into hallways and bathrooms and unassignable spaces. Okay, so you know, not taken out of this budget, but in addition to this budget, go ahead and give yourself another 25 to 30 percent of space just to kind of like uh, allow for all those circulation spaces. Okay. So within these, you're going to sort of divide it into some spaces. There's probably somewhere around 33 offices in that amount of space. We want to have a couple different meeting spaces on each of the floors. So some things that could be, you could think of them as conventional conference rooms, or they could just be nooks and corners of different sort of like hallway spaces, kind of like we have up on the second floor in the green area. Um, some utility and storage space. We need some stairs to get people up and down. It'd be very nice to have an elevator to provide access, especially for ADA, access to all the different floors. Okay, and in addition to sort of those basic needs, your client has decided based on their experience in, oh, classrooms that are a little bit too crowded and stuffy, that they'd like to create some new computer classrooms. Okay, that could actually accommodate 24 people comfortably. <laughs> okay, so go ahead and think about what that might look like if you had the chance to uh, reinvent things that weren't so well designed. Okay, so we'd like a couple of those. That's the classroom building. For the student center building, again, we need some offices over there, not in as many offices, because over here, it's really more we have some professional development programs that are going to be over there. They need some offices and some conference rooms, some utility space. We want an auditorium that can hold about 120 people. Okay, so let's think about that. That's not a huge auditorium. That's not like Memod. Okay, this is like 120 people, so let's think about it. Yeah, room one, is it 101? The horseshoe room over here. Okay, that holds about 50 people. All right, so it's about twice that big. Okay, so as you go thinking, there's actually guidelines about how many square feet you need per person, but for this, yeah, 
120 is not all that huge. That's you know 10 rows of 12. That's eight rows of whatever. It's you know it's not Dink, <laughs> it's not Cummings. It's kind of a smallish auditorium. Okay, so don't think it has to be gigantic. <laughs> okay, and some student center space where you can relax, eat lunch, share coffee, and work informally on your projects. Always been a pet peeve of mine about some engineering buildings I know that there's really not a whole lot of space for you to work in this building, for example. So going ahead and having uh, some more spaces where you can work informally and sit around tables and get your projects done, eat lunch, you know, grab something. You know, maybe there's more than just Koopa. <laughs> a little more in there, but go ahead. I don't expect you to go ahead and design a full restaurant, kitchen, and stuff like that. But it's OK to just sort of say, oh, cafe space. And then wherever you're envisioning the students kind of hanging out, oh, some tables and chairs is probably sufficient just to sort of indicate this is where they're going to meet, and some couches or whatever. Yeah, there's just a little bit of, you know, you're, you're sort of indicating function. You're not actually designing those spaces in great detail. Does that make sense? Excellent. OK. As you go through and put all this together, design options. OK, for the auditorium and the student center, we'd like you to go ahead and kind of put together just two different options for each of those. And these options don't have to be radically different, just different enough so that we can sort of see that you use two different options. So for the auditorium, for example, you could go through and say, hey, I'm going to have one auditorium which is square, and I'm going to have another <coughs> auditorium which is round shaped. OK, you could say I'm going to have one auditorium that is all glass on one side, and the other one's all closed and dark. Yeah. So you can sort of vary whatever variables you want in there. Just go ahead and kind of come up with two different things that you can then say, here's the plan for version one, here's the plan for option two, and we can look at them side by side. So don't have to be hugely radically different. Don't go through and design an auditorium in incredible detail and think you have to do a whole separate one. It could just be even in the shape of the auditorium. Do we have like long rows of seats that are linear versus horseshoe shaped? Do we slope the floor versus flatten it? Do we put the stage on the other side? Whatever it is, just, just something. Okay. Similarly, for the student center, you want to do something where there's just sort of different approaches to the whole thing. So, you know, and that could just be as simple as sort of rearranging within the outer shell how you're subdividing the spaces where the, where the cafe is versus where the student meeting space is versus where the tables are. And you know, it could be sort of very simple, but we'll talk some more about examples of design options and how you can use those features. You know, we did it in a very sort of big way the other day in terms of tall and skinny buildings versus short and squatty buildings. But that same feature will let us do things like, even if we wanted to trach this room and say, all the furniture's arranged this way in one option, and in another option, all the furniture's arranged this way. That is, again, a valid option. It's just sort of two different ways of looking at a lot of parts in space. Okay, So we're going to look at a couple of different design options there. This is really sort of secondary to your main design. So what I'd almost advocate doing is go ahead and come up with what you think is your sort of leading candidate proposal for what you think the auditorium and the student center should look like. And then we'll look at how you can make an option out of those things. It's really it's, it's a, it's a subordinate issue. It's a small issue <laughs> as opposed to the big issue. Okay, so but as you're designing them, if you could think ahead a little bit about you know what your option might be, that'll help you with your modeling a little bit. About you thinking about what it is you might vary between the options. Okay, but definitely come up with a design where you one is sort of your primary way of doing it. Yes. As a matter <coughs> of fact. A very good question. The answer is you don't need to, but to assist in this regard, I have created for you in the starting point file okay, a couple of different options. So you can think about putting them into the options right up front as you're doing it. Or let me kind of show you a real kind of easy way of approaching this. Let me go over to level two, or phase two. So. For example, I've got this building over here. I've put it in there. Currently, it's in my main model because I haven't really done anything to it. It's just kind of hanging around. If I wanted that to actually be an option one of, say, the student center, I could choose it. And then I can, under design options, I can add it to a set. And this is where I can actually sort of put it into a design option. If I've already put it there, 
So if I want this to be, oh, in my student center options, that's option A. I'll put it there. So it's going to show up in option A now. But if I go over to option B, you'll see it'll disappear. Okay, so you can do that after the fact. So either way, but you are right to sort of think ahead, because if you want to go ahead and put it in option A to start with, that will save you the trouble of having to move it later. Well, think about this, because <coughs> it's this question of whether it's actually in Revit 2010. It's definitely in Vasari, but I don't think it's actually here in Revit 2010, in terms of that little tool thing. With yeah. So I think in, you know, in uh, Revit 2010, it's just happening up there instead. So it's on the Manage tab. Correct. Yeah. This is actually just the same menu showing up at the top of the screen. Okay. Okay. Look, closing comments about this. More realistic modeling. Let's talk about this. Okay. As you go through and do your modeling, you know, we've been learning a lot of basic skills. You're getting better at modeling. So I want you to start thinking ahead to really how this is starting to translate into a true building. You know, as you're putting the different surfaces together, Think about what material you're going to use. You know, is it a stone surface? Is it a tile surface? Is it a vinyl surface? Okay. And as you're modeling, go ahead and choose what you think are good surfaces for those and good materials. And then actually be careful about that because when we render these structures, okay, you're going to actually want to have a good material chosen so that it'll render properly. It'll look good in terms of actually going through and producing those images. So be thinking about materials a little bit as you go through. Okay. Also think about really the whole issue of how it's going to be built. Now, don't go ahead for this one and think that you need to model the entire structure. In general, if you have spans between walls and columns and things that are less than 30 feet, we're probably OK in terms of being able to use a very conventional sort of structural system. You know, if things start to get a little bit longer than that, you want to think ahead to really where those columns are going to need to be to go through and support some beams or support the roof. Okay, and you can even put the columns in now. Don't worry about actually modeling the complete structural model. We're going to do that for the next assignment in terms of really modeling a detailed structural model that we can then go ahead and do some analysis on. But at least for this one, for your early design planning, think ahead to how that structure is going to work. So if you have a giant swooping, you know, expansive floor glass and there's no visible means of support, Think about where that support might need to come. Just kind of plan ahead. Because you, know, you want those column locations and structural features to be part of your design as opposed to something that the engineer inserted on you later. Okay, you want to plan ahead and kind of think about where it was going to be. So if that sounds a little obtuse and like that feels uncomfortable, don't sweat it too much now. We're going to go into that in a whole lot more detail. But if you are structurally inclined and you have some intuition about how structures work, you know, please feel free to drop in some columns right now just to kind of give us a sense of where those are going to be located okay, as part of your early design planning. Does that sort of make sense? I don't want, don't want to push that too, high, too far yet, but go ahead and like be thinking ahead that way. Okay, in terms of what's expected, in the end, you're going to put together some proposed floor plans okay, at eighth scale. These should include room tags, something called a color fill legend. Let me even kind of show you what that is. If I go back to level one, phase one, there's a really nice little legend up here, which is just showing for the different rooms what the function is and uh, colorizing the plan. And this is all just done on rooms and based on the categorization in the rooms. So the parameters in the rooms to go through and produce something like that. So we'll want to go through and produce some nice plans, <coughs> including that legend. We're going to do a couple enlarged floor plans where we zoom in on the specific area of your alternative options for the auditorium and student center. We'll do that at a higher scale. We're going to put the proposed roof plans. Actually, you know, that'll probably, I'll, I'll revise this to just be part of the site plan because you'll be able to see the roof forms from the site plan, which will be a good overall orientation to the how things are going out on the sheet, on, on the site. So that'd be good for that. Exterior elevations showing each of the new buildings. That was to your question. It would be probably better to put a separate elevation of building two and a separate elevation set of elevations for building three. Okay, building sections. Okay, updated schedules. Now, for all these schedules, the schedules have actually already been set up for you for phase one. 
So really, most of the exercise there is just going to be taking that schedule, duplicating it, and pointing it to phase two instead. Okay, that should work for about 90% of what's necessary there. And finally, we're going to get to renderings of this building. So we'll do some exterior renderings. And specifically next week, we're going to talk a lot about renderings and materials and lighting and how we can actually get very photorealistic views out of these. So even in preparation for that, if you can go ahead and just do some preliminary design about the shape of your building and be thinking about the materials, then Tuesday and Thursday next week you'll get a lot more value out of because we could actually be rendering your building. Okay, and you're also sort of getting towards the, the end point of creating these 3D views and you know, just uh, getting the renderings to look nice. Okay. And when you get all done with this, we're going to put it on tidal blocks that are a little bit larger. If you thought 24 by 36 was a lot of space to fill, 30 by 42 is an even larger space to fill. But don't. Go ahead and... Uh, we just need it in terms of being able to put these floor plan views on here. So there are sheets. And if we zoom on out, this is actually a gigantic 30 by 42 E sized piece of paper. And what happens is if you take a building of this size at eight scale and go dropping it on there, you'll see it fills up a lot of it. Okay. So this is one of those ones, rather than sort of expanding to fit, I might try cropping this down and just trying to fit a second view on this. Maybe I'll put some schedules on it right next to it or something like that. Okay, but yeah, as we tend to work with bigger buildings, we need bigger sheets of paper and all that type of stuff. Finally, when you get all done with this, submit everything and, oh, we're just going to simplify it this time. Submit everything as a single file because it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference whether you put them in a separate file or in a single file. Submit everything in a single file where you check off all the sheet views that you want to include as well as the default 3D model. You only need to include that once. So the view you want to include is typically that one because that one typically includes all the information in the model. That's enough to give us a 3D model to navigate around in. So you don't need to include every version of it because it just puts the duplicate copies in there. Just that one will do it. Okay, let us pause there and say, hey, there's the assignment. Um, when's it due? When's it due? Oh, when's it due? It is due a week from Thursday. So a week Thursday at midnight. Okay, so given that amount of time, okay, plan accordingly, okay, but Realize that to, to meet that design, uh, that objective, yeah, you aren't going to do an incredibly detailed design of two whole buildings and a student center and all that and incredibly uh, detail within that period of time. No one's expecting you to spend every waking hour between now and then doing this. So go ahead and necessarily kind of approach your design somewhat simply. I want you to sort of abstract and not really worry about the nth level of detail in terms of your design. Because for this one, it's really much more about sort of the big issue. You know, did you really get the total amount of square footage in there? You, do you understand the shape of your building and how the roof is going to work? You know, do you sort of understand it at that level? You don't really need to get down to furnishing every room and really putting every last toilet and sink into the building, stuff like that. Because if you just sort of say, this is the restroom, you know, with a little imagination, I'll imagine how it's laid out. Okay, so go ahead and you know, some big issues to get resolved, but you don't have to get everything done in terms of doing that. Because really, in the total span of a week and a half, there's only, only so much you can design. Okay, This type of project, you know, if this was really, if you were a design team and you were really asked to do this, you know, I'd probably give you four weeks to come up with your first cut at the preliminary design or something like that. Or within two weeks, at least come back with some overall shapes so we could talk about them before you go into more detailed design. But yeah, within a week and a half, there's really only so much you're going to get done. So accept that up front and don't beat yourself up where in next week on Tuesday night, you're only so far into it. You know, yeah, start by making the list ac accessible as opposed to infinite. And we'll sort of approach it that way. And if you have any questions about how deep to go into it, you know, please ask. And we'll sort of try and give you some more guidance about how deep to go into it. But really, yeah, you aren't really able, you're not going to be able to do a detailed design on this building. So keep it fairly high level because at your first, well, even this is the way it would work in industry. Yeah, as your first set of recommendations go, 
you know, when you come on back, the, the university wants to sort of see the overall shape and form. Does it look sort of appealing? Did you meet my program requirements in terms of the amount of space? At that first meeting, no one's caring about the doorknobs and just exactly how all the tables fit into the room. Okay, beyond the fact that you're sort of saying that it actually does work as a space. So you know, allow yourself that flexibility. Okay, beauty. Let's go ahead and pause there. Stand up, stretch, gather your uh, wits about you, and come on back in five minutes, because when you do, we'll actually start talking about how you can approach this and work within this model file to get this done. <laughs>